Hi there, welcome to a workshop on responsible data consumption. I'm Stephanie Cannell from Data Driven Detroit, and I'm going to be walking through some different um, tips and tips of tricks of the trade um, as we're consuming like a excessive amount of data on a daily basis during the pandemic response. Um, I noticed some different things that people can really kind of engage with the data in a better and more effective manner. And so this workshop is really to give you some of the tools that I use when I'm reading a article or a research paper so that you are a more intelligent consumer of the information that's being presented. So just for a quick background, Data Driven Detroit is the Metro Detroit data intermediary. So we provide data to nonprofits and foundations and community members in Detroit and the Southeast Michigan region to help you make better decisions um, in their programming and projects that they're working on. So this is right up my alley. So the agenda for today is pretty simple. Um, I've developed four tips for understanding data. So we're going to go through each of them along with some examples from coronavirus as well as other parts of the data world um, to kind of give you some of those tools and just to start the, that critical thinking um, process and show you how to apply some of the tips and the questions that we're going to talk about to real life issues. So the four tips are define the terms, think about the context, know the data limitations and understand the analysis and kind of an overarching theme in this is to be skeptical and dig deeper so it's very rare in a news article that the reporter is going to be the expert on the topic or an expert on the research paper and oftentimes it's going to require you to click on a few links and kind of read a little bit more about the issue to be better informed as well as to be um, sure that you're when you're sharing the article that you're being a responsible consumer of the media and not sharing something that's kind of overblown or understated and making sure that the headline is like actually supported by the article beneath it. So first some background about kind of how this workshop came to be is that there's a lot of data happening. Um, so we've noticed early on that I took this um, graphic from Nature magazine back in March. And it just demonstrates how rapidly coronavirus research has escalated. So there was nothing in December, January. And then by March, there was almost 600 preprint articles. And so that's just a very rapid increase of um, the, this topic in a very short period of time. And it's very unusual um, in academic research. And so this has created a glut almost of news articles about each of these journals. And so it kind of creates confusion because sometimes the headlines are conflicting and we don't have enough information in the news articles usually to kind of make sure that, understand how the articles might actually fit together um, because the headlines and the summary of the articles seem like the, they couldn't both be true. And so this requires us as the public to be fairly patient as researchers are sorting through different data. And it requires flexibility um, that we can adjust our opinions as new information becomes available because so much was unknown in the early days of the pandemic. And even today, as new information becomes available, we have to be really flexible in being grounded in data because the data might start to demonstrate different trends than what we saw when we just had a tiny snapshot of one or two months. As we get six months or a year, we'll understand more. And that's going to require every single one of us to be flexible in how we think about policy, how we think about our own personal decisions and things like that. So the first tip that we have is define the terms. So I want you to think about it for a second, but true or false? My watermelon weighs more than your orange. Now, if you were using a typical definition of a watermelon and an orange, you would obviously say false. But if you weren't going to think about, well, ask me what my definitions were, you would be wrong because I'm trying to compare 
a small piece of a watermelon to a whole orange. And so obviously in this case, the orange weighs more than the watermelon, but you wouldn't have known that was true or false if you hadn't asked me about what terms I was using to define those pieces of fruit. And so when we're talking about define the terms, you wanna start at, by asking what is actually being compared? Are they being measured exactly the same? And has the definition of those terms stayed consistent over time? Because each one of those can change how the data is actually interpreted and what the reasonable conclusions that you can draw from that data are. So first we have some different data definitions. A really good example of this is infant mortality. It's actually defined differently in different countries, which makes comparing infant mortality information between countries sort of difficult. So for example, in the US, an infant is, includes any live birth, regardless of how old or how um, large the baby is. And some countries have weights or age thresholds in their infant mortality definitions. So that means if a baby is not a certain age or not a certain weight, they're not considered an infant in that infant mortality definition. So you can see how this might change the entire sample size of infants and would actually lead to lower mortality rates in those countries because smaller, younger babies are more likely to have life-threatening complications when they're born. So how does this impact our understanding of coronavirus? Um, one of those could be who has recovered from coronavirus. Everyone sort of has different definitions of that. So in China, the definition of a recovery means that somebody has two negative tests and no symptoms. In Michigan, um, the state's definition of that is 30 days post onset of symptoms and still alive. So that means that you were tested positive and you told them when your symptoms started and they just count out. And after 30 days, they consider you recovered. The CDC's definition at this point in time is that you haven't had a fever for 72 hours and other symptoms have subsided and it's been at least seven days since you were sick. So you can see each of these definitions is very different and will create a different, different sample. And so comparing between China and Michigan and the CDC would be really difficult and would require a lot of discussion of how those different samples can um, be different based on how the entity is defining a recovery from coronavirus. Another thing that we've noticed in looking at coronavirus data is that definitions are changing constantly. So early on during the COVID outbreak, the state was actually reporting um, testing data, but you can see over here on the right hand side, hang on, oh look, it highlights it for me, cool. Um, the testing data on the right hand side is from early on um, in mid-March, and the testing only reflected tests being done by the Michigan Department of Health. Whereas now we have commercial labs included, public health labs, et cetera. So the definition of who is being tested is different today than it was in March. Um, and we can also see it in the note on the left-hand side, what some of those, what some of the additional um, terms, um, definition of terms might kind of make in thinking about coronavirus tests. So one, people have more than one test, which is reflected in this data. So you'll see that sometimes, some days the number of positives is much lower than the number of total tests. And that's because somebody may have had one or more tests done. And tests that are conducted in out-of-state labs are not being included in the sample. So there's still a lot of missing data in what we're reporting at the state level and just being aware of that as we consume data and consume under, um, information about how it's changing and how it might be good or bad and all of those things, it's important to realize all of these different layers of information and where it might be incomplete and where it might have changed over time because those all impact how reasonably sure we can be in the conclusions that are being drawn from the data. So I just wanna stop real quick and see if there are any questions on tip one, um, which was define the terms. All right. 
going to move on. So tip two is think about the context. So another question for you. It, was it difficult to purchase toilet paper in 2020, so this year? And this is a tr another trick question, surprise. Um, it depends. If you were talking about January 2020, then no, it wasn't difficult to buy pa toilet paper. But if you were talking about March 2020, yes, it was difficult to buy toilet paper. Um, and that's just a very recent example of how data changes over time and we have to really be aware of the context of the data collection. Um, and so that's what we wanna think about when we're thinking about um, data context. So think about, is it a fast moving situation? If it is, what data was collected a month ago might not be representative of what is happening right now. Should the data have, could the data have changed significantly? Is it outdated? Could there be a bigger trend that explains the data? We're gonna go through a few examples that shows these in more concrete terms. So one of the impacts of rapidly shifting data is it changes um, the comparisons. So remember how the definitions changed in testing data. What we were collecting in early March isn't directly comparable to what's being collected today. And so that means what was true two weeks ago is also not necessarily true today. So one of the things that we have to be really sure of right now is checking the dates of the data and checking the dates of the research articles that you're reading because it's so rapidly changing and so rapidly updating that science is kind of identifying things and letting us know what's happening as they go on. But we have to just be good stewards of that and make sure that we're not reading outdated information and that there hasn't been new um, information that can kind of supplant and makes that um, outdated. So a really good example of this is some of the coronavirus testing information compared at the country level. So early on um, in the crisis, President Trump started boasting about the U.S. versus South Korea coronavirus testing. He correctly stated that we had tested more people um, than South Korea had, but some of the fact checkers started looking at this claim and found that really when you start thinking about the impact of those tests, since the United States is so much larger, you should be thinking about the per capita test rate. And that in the United States, the per capita testing rate for South Korea was way lower than, or the per capita testing rate in the United States was way lower than in South Korea. And so I was going to write a blog post about the importance of per capita data and using this as a um, example of how important and how this comparison can help. And I went to a website to get a graph to prove my point that the US was lagging so far behind and actually found that that wasn't the case anymore. And so I went into the data expecting one thing and then it gave me, when I looked at the chart, it was completely different than what I had expected. And so I had to sit back, step back from what I was writing and kind of reorient myself to what the data was saying. And so it's so quickly moving that it even trips up somebody who works with data every day like me. And another thing that we want to remember is that there is always a chance that there are bigger trends at play. So this is a headline in a graph that I pulled directly from a local paper and they are blaring the headline that the new cases of coronavirus have slowed significantly as of Monday. Um, this is a few weeks ago and um, they have this graph and if you look at the graph you're like oh wow yeah this weekend the the cases have dropped dramatically from earlier in last week and so i was looking at it and i was like i wonder and so if you highlight the weekends um it looks like there are pretty significant drops every sunday and monday so while there was a drop on monday it can be attributed to an overall trend, a bigger context when you zoom out of reporting declining on the weekends, which makes sense. There's people are less likely to be in the hospital. Some of the systems are different. Um, people aren't necessarily 
do in the office is at the same rate. And so on the weekends, the case reporting falls. And then on Tuesday, the case reports jump back up. You can see after those highlighted um, dips, the next day is always a jump back up. And so there's a bigger picture here. And then another really important part of thinking about the context is making sure you're aware of the source. So this is a silly example that says studies show clickbait article titles aren't just on the internet. So really it's just being a thoughtful consumer of media and thinking about who's the author. Do they have an agenda in writing about this topic? Do they usually write about political pieces? Are they usually looking towards something seeking truth or are they usually seeking to support something that they believe? And so is the website or newspaper a reliable source of news? Is it, there's a lot of different things you can think about in this, um, in thinking about the source, but just being aware that when you click on an article, sometimes it's not going to be immediately apparent that they have an agenda and you really might need to dig a little bit into that to see what, whether or not this is a reliable source of media. So are there any questions on that? Thinking about the context. No? Great. So the third tip is knowing the data limitations. And now this starts to get a little bit tricky because the more you know about statistics, the easier it will be for you to stop to um, find data limitations. But I have a few different tips in here and questions that you can ask yourself when you're reading the news to kind of start, just start those wheels turning. And remember, you don't have to have the answer always. It's just being skeptical and being able to dig deeper into the topic and knowing that something, just because you read something and it sounds true and it sounds reasonable, doesn't mean that the data is actually saying that thing is true. Um, and that's really important, I think, when we're consuming media. A lot of times we see something and we're like, that makes sense. Oh, look, the data backs it up. Um, and that's not always the case because the data has limitations. And while it makes sense, um, it doesn't necessarily prove the hypothesis that you think it does. So the first thing that I really want to drive home about data limitations is that data is only as good as what is reported and recorded in the data collection process. So what does that mean? A really easy example that we can look at is crime. So when a robbery is committed, first somebody has to call 911 and report the robbery. When the police respond, they have to submit a report this report has to have the correct address, the correct incident number, the correct description of the situation, et cetera. And then the whole thing has to go into a data set and then be processed into an available data set. So there are multiple places there where if somebody doesn't call, if the police put in the wrong address, the wrong incident number, that robbery is now not correctly coded into the data set. And some of those things are impossible to know. Like it's impossible for me a year after the fact to look at something and say like, oh yeah, this robbery was actually committed at a different address. And so we can only use the data that is reported and recorded um, in a, being aware that there are these limitations in the reporting process is really important as you start thinking through like, what is this data telling me? What is this report saying? How was this data collected? How could it have been flawed? And those are all questions that you can answer even without a really deep background in statistics. So thinking through this, could the data collection process have skewed the results? If you're collecting data on who likes football, um, could the data collection process be better if you go to the mall on a random Wednesday night um, versus going to the mall on Super Bowl Sunday? Well, um, the Data collection process, if you go to the mall and ask people on Super Bowl Sunday if they like football, is probably going to be really skewed towards people who don't like football. Because anybody who likes football is probably at home watching the Super Bowl and not at the mall shopping. 
And then is the data being collected from a group with similar characteristics? So that's thinking about if we're comparing, for example, a treatment option for coronavirus, is the data being collected from the same population? So we're looking at the outcomes. So how many people recover? Are we comparing people who are super duper sick to people who only have a mild case and saying, oh, look, this medication is super effective. Or are we comparing people who are super, super sick to people who are super, super sick and saying that, and then that, that comparison is like an apples to apples comparison and makes for a better case that that medication is effective. So remember that the same exact data collected from two different groups of people can impact the results. So thinking back to our fruit example in the first tip, the, we can collect the pounds, right? We can collect the weight in ounces or pounds or whatever. Um, but because we're sampling from a whole fruit versus a piece of fruit, it's still gonna, it's gonna impact the results of that comparison if we're not being very transparent that we're measuring different types of fruit. So when we think about data collection with coronavirus, um, one of the really important components is in the testing process. So when we're thinking about how many people are tested, that helps us understand how many cases there are, et cetera. But when we're comparing over time and when we're comparing um, just the results overall, we need to think about some specific things. So who was tested and who is being tested now? We know that's changed significantly. At the beginning of the crisis, it was very difficult to get tested. So only the sickest people were being tested. If you were in the hospital, admitted, um, some essential workers were able to get tests early on. Versus now, um, Detroit announced recently that they'll be testing anybody. Um, and that's a very big change and it's gonna change how you're able to interpret the testing results. So are there false positives, false negatives? Do we know how often they happen? Are all of the labs reporting their testing information? If some labs aren't reporting the testing results, how could that skew what we're seeing at the aggregate level? And so these are all questions that when I look at the testing data, I'm asking myself. Um, I don't have answers to all of them, but these are all things I kind of keep in the back of my mind as I'm consuming media related to COVID testing. So in Michigan, one thing to really keep in mind when we're talking about the limitations on data is that our testing data is actually at the specimen level. Uh, so that means that every individual is not represented by just one test. Um, it's often the case that one person will get multiple tests because they're trying to test negative so they can return back to work or something like that. And so that's where we start to get more testing than we have cases um, because one person might have three or four positive tests. Um, and that's actually those positive tests, all four of them are going to be reported in Michigan's testing data. Other states aren't reporting data like that. For example, Florida, they're just reporting positive tests for, by the individual. Um, and then who is reporting data? In Michigan, we already talked about how commercial labs are now incorporated into the public data, but only one is um, LabCorp. And Quest Diagnostics is also conducting COVID testing, but their data isn't being fed into this. Um, anybody who has their tests being conducted out, at an out-of-state lab, um, those aren't included in our testing data. And so just being aware that there are still some significant limitations to the data helps us be more aware of how skeptical to be when somebody says something is a fact and for sure. Um, in many cases with the way the pandemic data has rolled out, the, it's really impossible for anybody to know something for 100% sure right now because the data is still fairly limited and we're ramping up our capabilities at reporting and recording a COVID case. And so making sure that we're aware, again, of the limitations of that is really important. And then I wanted to talk really quickly about antibody testing because this is becoming really um, popular to talk about because we want to know retrospectively since testing was so limited early on to very severe cases, how many people actually had COVID, how many people were infected, and how many people have recovered. Those are all really critical questions to answer so that we can move forward. 
And antibody testing is how the medical field is going to determine that. So there have been three big studies in the headlines over the last couple of weeks. And I just wanted to talk about, talk through their samples so you can kind of get an idea of how I look at an article about this. Um, so in Santa Clara County, the methodology where they recruited people was advertising on Facebook and anyone who wanted a test could qualify and come get tested at some off-site facility. The New York Health Department conducted their test by setting up shop at grocery stores and just randomly testing whoever came um, in to shop that day if they consented, obviously. And then there was a group of urgent care doctors in California who tested people seeking care at their urgent cares. And so only one of these, in my opinion, has like really great um, sampling methodology, and that's the New York Health Department. So in Santa Clara County, when they were advertising on Facebook and people had to go obtain the test, um, that's gonna skew towards people who were sick, who are curious if they had it, things like that. So you're probably gonna skew your sample towards people who did have coronavirus. The New York Health Department, by just randomly testing people at the grocery store, you're gonna get a better sample of just the general population and whoever walks into the grocery store, maybe they were sick two months ago, but like they're not, that being sick two months ago doesn't impact them wanting to go to the grocery store, like they need food. So they just happen to be there and are incorporated into the sample. And that helps get a better idea of like who is represented in that sample. And then the urgent care patients, obviously people, if they're not feeling well, are seeking out care. And so by testing people who are already sick, um, you're kind of skewing that population again towards people who may have had coronavirus for a long enough time that they have antibodies, but maybe they're still feeling crappy and crummy and they're going to urgent care for that reason. So that's just one way, like that's just one example of how you can kind of start seeing and critically thinking about some of the data is thinking through like, who are they talking to? Is it a representative? random sample and that can help you start to see whether a study is helpful in understanding the coronavirus pandemic or not. So that's our third tip which is knowing the data limitations. We have one more to go. The fourth one is understand the analysis. Don't want you to freak out. I'm not saying to go get a degree in statistics but there are some questions that you can ask yourself again that are very simple and can kind of highlight some of the limitations of the data and again. Um, so really quick, I wanna review how research works. So when a paper is published, the authors are saying, hey, this blue dot, we know this thing. Um, they also are gonna write a bunch usually about all of the limitations and new questions that their research finds. So there are, their research article says, we know this little blue dot, but here's a big, big dot that we, we don't actually know when we don't have the, the data to answer all of these other questions. So when we limit our questions to this teeny tiny piece of the puzzle, we can kind of come up with an answer. And so later on, uh, another study is published and it seems like it conflicts with the first study, but really that's usually because they have different data, samples, methods, assumptions, et cetera. And they're gonna still say, oh yeah, and we still don't know all of this stuff. And so when there's kind of a critical mass of all of those different um, papers that are examining this is what we don't know, a, another researcher will come and do like a complete meta-analysis. They'll read all of the papers and say, okay, well, when you take into account this kind of a method, this is the result. And when we have this sample, this is the result. And they kind of create a, um, kind of connect all the dots and try to create a tapestry of sorts of data and information from all of these individual little dots of information that each research paper um, represents. And it's okay when two studies have conflicting conclusions because it's usually not that the the, the they conflict, is that they're really rooted in something different. 
and understanding how those work together is really important and that's part of why we have to be so patient as the researchers and scientists are trying to figure out more about coronavirus because it takes time to make those dots start to like appear and then it takes even more time to synthesize all of this information into something that's coherent and connects all of the different little pieces of research that are being done. So when we want to understand the analysis from a more a higher level, um, the first thing I would recommend you do is click on the link to the research paper and just read that they usually will have a short um, the word, a paragraph that describes what the paper is about. The actual word is escaping me right now. But in that paragraph, they'll start to acknowledge what limitations they that the paper has. Um, they might mention what assumptions were required to make the analysis. But there be, and then as you're reading through that short paragraph that says, okay, well, they did X, Y, Z. Just think to yourself, if I looked at this data from a different perspective, could there possibly be different results? And this picture, these two pictures show us a, a very powerful way that there's the same data being fed into the camera um, and two different methods interpret the data differently. So in the first, we have a telephoto lens that makes everybody seem super close together, um, super not social distancing. And then in the second photo, the photographer used a wide angle lens and that shows everybody spaced out the same like six feet waiting orderly in line and so this is a one example of how data can be looked at differently and so just thinking critically about that and if you look at the data differently could there be a different answer if you thought through the process a little bit differently if you had one more different one different assumption or you added in something else like could it impact what you were seeing and if you start thinking through and exercising those muscles you'll start to get a lot quicker and a lot faster um, at figuring out how the methodology might impact the data so when we're thinking about coronavirus especially early on there were many many models that were popping up that kind of predicted the peak and predicted ICU usage and things like that um, and those models because we didn't know a lot about COVID-19 yet relied on assumptions and so being able to dig into the model and say like well what were they assuming the social distancing rate was was it before we did social distancing that they were predicting this many deaths or was it after was it a totally super strict lockdown where nobody left their house for two months or was it some casual well there's no big public events and so just acknowledging those different assumptions and knowing how the researchers were incorporating data into their models is helpful for kind of framing out whether or not that analysis might be reliable if the article doesn't talk about the assumptions and the um, you can usually go into the original link, Google it if you have to, um, and try to find if the author is upfront about those limitations or do they present ways to be careful with interpreting the conclusions. So when I was in grad school, I worked with a research professor who does a lot of research on South Korea and their school systems and things like that. And one of the things he almost always has in his conclusion paragraphs is that you have to be careful interpreting the South Korean data in the United States or other Western countries because the cultural norms are just so different in South Korea versus other countries that what the way that data was presented and the way that data was analyzed is sound, but the cultural implications and the way people behaved based on the information, the data or the activities or the policy or whatever we were researching, that behavior might be different based on cultural contexts and things that we can't really measure and bake into that analysis sample right away. So if the author isn't super upfront in their paper about limitations, that is a red flag in my opinion that you should be very careful in how you use that information that they're presenting. 
So here's an example for how numbers might change, um, especially in the coronavirus when you're thinking about different methodology. So on the left hand side, we have the total number of cases in Michigan by county. And you can see that um, mostly Wayne County, some Oakland and Macomb County, they're like, they pop right away, very highlighted, very apparent that that's where some cases are very, are, the case rate is very high. Um, that information is helpful because it shows where the most cases are. But when you look at the data and you account for how many people live in a county, so this is important because our rural counties don't have the same capacity as Metro Detroit for ICUs and things like that because they're serving a smaller population. So when you account for a per capita um, case rate, you can kind of see how much more other places pop, especially up in say Northern Michigan or over in Grand Rapids and even in some of the lower peninsula around Flint and things like that. The, the caseload seems to be a, a lot more, a lot higher because we're accounting for those places having less people. And so that's how the data can kind of shift when you, one simple way the data can shift when you just analyze it a little bit differently. And so some people will try to manipulate data and highlight it in a way that proves their point. Uh, and it's just, you have to be very careful um, when you're looking at graphs and things like that to read the x-axis, the y-axis, make sure you're, you're like aware of what is actually being presented to you. And if it's possible, it was manipulated to make a point or if it was, if it's being presented authentically. So that was the fourth tip, understand the analysis. Um, I just want to go right into real quick this idea of be skeptical and dig deeper. The first question is, like the overarching question is, are there other plausible explanations for the conclusion that the researchers have? In many cases, the answer is yes. And the what I would recommend is that you think through that and then think about how likely it is. Some things are gonna be more likely than others, obviously. Some things will make more logical sense than others. Um, but thinking through if there are other plausible explanations is, one helpful mental activity where you can kind of just daydream about the situation a little bit and think through like some of them like is it plausible that like aliens came to Michigan and beamed down coronavirus probably not um, I would not consider that a plausible explanation um, and so there that it is a virus that we um, give to each other and it's transmitted between humans that's kind of, that's more plausible than it's aliens picking who gets it. Um, and so just sometimes you can think of really absurd explanations and discount them. But um, just thinking through and being practical about are there other things that we could add to this that would change my opinion. Um, and it's okay to not be an expert because you can still critically think about the data, especially if you've used those questions that I laid out. And always trust your gut. Um, there are places where you're going to be consuming data and you're just like, that's not the, the whole picture. Dig deeper, like read more, click on the link, see if the links that are in the article actually say what the article says they say. Because sometimes something can be accidentally misrepresented or something like that. And you can do this. You can be skeptical and dig deeper, even if you're not a statistics expert. So the overall questions that we have, just a quick reminder is define the terms, think about the context, know the data limitations, and understand the analysis. And so I hope with those tips, you're able to go out and read some of the news articles and media about coronavirus data with a little bit more confidence and ability to interpret it intelligently and thoughtfully. So thank you for coming to the workshop and I hope you have a wonderful day.